It was the largest mass killing in Egypt's modern history. Ten years ago this week, Egyptian soldiers overran a protest camp in Cairo's Rabah Square, killing hundreds. Six weeks earlier, the military had overthrown the elected government of Mohamed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, and supporters of the ousted government had created a protest city in Rabah. Its destruction still reverberates in today's Egypt. Nick Schifrin looks back. Just after dawn, chaos. Live fire flew through one of Cairo's busiest squares. For 12 hours, Egyptian forces besieged Rabah. They bulldozed homemade barricades. Snipers fired from nearby rooftops. The aftermath, a scorched square. A camp turned into a carcass. And mosques converted to morgues. The government death toll was 624. Human Rights Watch says the real count was likely at least 1,000. Rabah had become a tent city. Tens of thousands built a self-sustaining protest with their own kitchens, water distribution, and administration that ran 24-7 for more than 45 days. They demanded the reinstatement of Mohamed Morsi, Muslim Brotherhood leader who became Egypt's first democratically elected president after the 2011 revolution that deposed Hosni Mubarak. And they protested then-General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who in early July 2013 had seized power. Sisi became president a year later in 2014, in elections that independent observers called unfair. He would later change the constitution to remain president potentially past 2030. Today, Rabah is quiet. The anniversary was not marked. Nobody was ever held accountable. In Sisi's Egypt, there is no room for memorializing massacre. Since 2013, the government has imprisoned more than 60,000 Egyptians, from liberal activists to anyone connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. Ten years ago it was a turning point, proving the military was willing to use force to cement its hold on power. And that hold on power remains as strong now as it was ten years ago. For more, we turn to our own Jane Ferguson, who was in Cairo that day and covered the Rabah massacre, and Hossam Bagat, an Egyptian human rights activist and founder of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights based in Cairo. Thanks very much, both of you. Uh, Jane, uh, take us back to that day. What did you see? It began early in the morning, Nick. You had massive units of the uh, Egyptian security forces go in and simply start opening fire. Now, myself and my team were at one of the exit and entrance points of the uh, Rabat Square uh, soon afterwards, as soon as we rushed there. And we saw people being pulled out, those with massive gunshot wounds, and just utter scenes of chaos as people were trying to flee. And eventually, we made our way, uh, you know, by, by simply following the crowds to various um, places places where, where the bodies were being taken. And what we found when we entered a mosque was that it was filled with an increasing number of bodies of those who had been shot by their own government. One of the main challenges for those simply trying to organize this amount of bodies and process them is trying to keep the bodies from decomposing. Here now, they've started bringing in bags of ice as an emergency scenario, placing them on top of the bodies to try to keep them from decaying. Those were really shocking scenes at the time. It's important to remember that this is believed to have been one of the biggest ever uh, single events of uh, demonstrators or protesters being shot dead in the street in modern history. And in the following days and weeks, because what happened was an increasing crackdown on protesters, Morsi supporters and journalists. And that crackdown, as you said, Jane, uh, continued to journalists. How did the government make clear uh, they were willing to prosecute journalists? And how does that uh, willingness continue to this day? Well, shortly afterwards, it was as uh, resistance kept continuing and small protests were popping up, the Egyptian authorities actually arrested uh, largely the entire bureau of the Al Jazeera English team at the time, which included an Australian journalist, Peter Greste. Him and his team and uh, his bureau chief, Mohamed Fahmi, they were, uh, they were arrested and, uh, and sent uh, to jail and effectively spent over a year in an Egyptian jail. That was a message to news organizations, to international news organizations, Americans, Europeans, that sending journalists to Egypt to investigate and report on human rights would be extremely dangerous. And what we've seen over the last decade is that that has worked. 
Osam Bagat, how was Rabat a turning point for Egypt? It was a turning point in, in many different ways. It was basically not just the end of the promise of um, the Egyptian revolution of 2011, but really the end, end of our country as we know it. Egypt uh, was never really you know, a liberal uh, democracy. It was always a country with a problematic um, uh, human rights um, record and, and serious area, areas of concerns. But what we saw following Rabah is just rule by one military uh, leader uh, who established a dictatorship uh, uh, that um, not just um, uh, imprisoned all government critics, but for the first the first time um, in Egyptian modern history, eviscerated civic space altogether. So we have been ruled for the last uh, 10 years without um, opposition parties, without uh, critical media, without independent courts uh, or really parliamentary oversight, uh, without any space for civil society and with zero um, room for dissent and zero public demonstrations. Uh, was there ever any justice for what happened in Rabah? The only way to describe it is the opposite of justice. Um, it's been 10 years uh, with, um, you know, according to government uh, figures, at least uh, 600, um, you know, 80 maybe um, uh, killed, uh, thousands uh, injured. And um, the only people that have been arrested and prosecuted since uh, then are the survivors of those massacres. There was one official, official inquiry conducted that the um, government um, um, allowed and um, uh, you know, was sort of forced into um, 10 years ago. That inquiry produced a report that was submitted to the president, yet the, yet the report of that fact-finding commission was never published until really this week when we made um, excerpts of it public for the very first time. And, um, you know, surprisingly, of course, um, the conclusions of that inquiry that were never made public um, almost to a large extent match the conclusions of independent journalists, uh, of independent civil society investigations, which is that the government knew at a very high level uh, um, that there is going to be a high human toll of casualties, that the shooting was indiscriminate. It was disproportionate with the threat that these security forces faced from only a handful of armed elements. And most importantly, that the vast majority of those killed that day were peaceful protesters, um, as opposed to the government's um, um, you know, false narrative for, for the last 10 years that um, uh, they had to open fire um, at armed um, um, elements among the protesters. And finally, Jane Ferguson, in the time we have left, you have reported so much from across the region. Put this in perspective for us. What is the legacy uh, of Rabah and all the changes in Egypt that we've just been discussing on North Africa and the Middle East? We've really got to look, Nick, back at 2013 as a year of, of something of a crisis in American foreign policy in the Middle East and in the Arab world. Of course, at the time, you had the Obama government or the, or the Obama administration, which had, whenever you had the coup happen, they would not use the word coup. They they condemned uh, any, any of the violence that happened as a result of this, of this massacre. Of course, in the same year, we also had the famous red line in Syria, where the Obama administration had said if uh, the Assad regime uses chemical weapons uh, on their own people, they would be willing to act militarily. And that red line was crossed, and there wasn't really any military response from the United States. It was in that moment that I think a lot of people in the region look back and will say, this is when United States policy was in something of a crisis, whereby U.S. withdrawal from the Middle East uh, was happening at a time when people were being massacred by their own governments. And the last 10 years, years has seen an extraordinary amount of violence uh, against civilians, of human rights abuses across the Middle East, and a real backlash against those, those heady, hopeful Arab Spring days. Our Jane Ferguson, Hossam Bagat, thank you very much to you both. Thank you.